Coming to minister the word of the Lord is Apostle Emmanuel Vivian Duncan. In, uh, for those who are viewing on live stream outside of the churches that have joined us, if or you're here today in New Dimensions, if you're hearing him for the first time, he and his wife, Apostle Gemma, are the, are the senior pastors of, of the Divine Destiny in, in Trinidad, in Dago Martin. But they also cover churches throughout Trinidad, Tobago, throughout the Caribbean, throughout the world. God is using them mightily in ministering to churches, strengthening churches, uh, reshaping the destiny of men and women. And he obeyed the call of the Lord in, 19, in 1986 to preach the gospel after the Lord began to move upon him in, in some very powerful ways. God has raised him up to speak to the nations, whether right there in, in Trinidad or wherever God takes him. Whenever he speaks, especially when he speaks prophetically, you can rest assured that word will come to pass. He has spoken uh, nationally, spoken to nations, to governments. God has given him the privilege of training cabinets. Yeah. I'm not talking about cabinets in our home. We're talking about government officials. God's given him the, the privilege of speaking to government officials, doing training, and um, I really bless God for him. He's also apostle over pastor myself and New Dimensions Ministry. So uh, we, we really bless God for them and uh, for impacting our lives. So for, for God, I thank God that he caused our paths to cross, not by accident, but by his divine plan and purpose. And they have been very instrumental in our lives in so many different ways, even in, his, in this church. So when he speaks, he speaks as, as a covering over this ministry, and we will receive the word of God today. It's an honor to welcome Apostle Emmanuel Vivian Duncan and Pastor Jamin Duncan again to Barbados and particularly to New Dimensions. I want the church to stand, please. And if you, wherever you are, Divine Destiny Churches, Streams of Living Water, let's stand, please, all of us, and let's celebrate the man and woman of God. I believe in celebrating people of God. Let's welcome them, let's celebrate God, and let's celebrate God and praise God for what he's doing in their lives. Apostle Emmanuel Vivian Duncan. I mean, we can do better than that. Praise God. All right, just uh, courtesies, we give God praise for all his goodness and his mercies towards us. And uh, I just want you to find five people and tell them this for me. People want change, but they don't want to be changed. I'll say it again. People want change, but they don't want to be changed. Tell five people that for me. Good. And then we may be seated. Amen. Put that deep inside your system because it's going to pop up during this week as you have to deal with some revelation and information and whatever other stuff that will come your way, that your mind is not readily prepared to take because of certain mindsets that we have settled on and will be very much challenged to change, to remove 
in favor of what God wants for us now. But for now, I'm going to be calling Apostle Gemma. Last Friday, we celebrated 39 years of marriage. Amen. And as we said, as we said to the to those who came to the seminar yesterday, those who came to the seminar yesterday, wasn't it awesome? Amen. As we said to them, whatever you invest in, there must be a profit. I said there must be a what? A profit. You must come out better than you were before. Right? And we invested 39 years. In fact, it's 1972. We went into training college together, got married in 1976. And in 1972, into the second year, 1973, I was very successful in chasing the other suitors. Very successful. One of them described me in England to, to, to somebody from the church we were preaching in. He said, oh, Vivian, he took up the pot of gold I dropped. Poor fellow. Oh. So let's just welcome Apostle Gemma. She is more than a pot of gold right now. Amen. Loading and anointed for God. We should even stand down here. Thank you. Good morning to you. It's great to be in Barbados. I agree that God lives here. Amen. I, it's, I, I actually dream of and look forward to Accra Beach. It's my favorite place. I, what you don't appreciate, I do. And so I look forward to getting up every morning, walking down the boardwalk. And God is all around me. It's so easy to worship him when you see him in his beauty, just walking down there. That's, that was a great investment that your government made. At least I don't know which one, but that was great. Amen. And we actually in Trinidad borrowed the concept, and there is a boardwalk in Trinidad. And would you believe it was built where we live? Oh, hallelujah! I feel God heard me because I was really jealous of the Bajans with their boardwalk, and He gave me one so I can walk. God bless you. Um, I, we do have a, a number of books. I, I always love coming here you know, where there is deep felt and deep hearted worship. And I give God praise to participate. I, I, I too have come to receive because sometimes you actually receive more than you give. So my heart is open to whatever God wants to say. We have some books. We have a book table. As you know, we are authors. And the amazing thing is that the anointing rubbed off on me and it actually rubbed off on our children. Our two sons are also writers. And so if, when you go to the book table, you'll see books by Apostle Vivian, books by me, and uh, books by our two sons. I have my latest publication. I'm sorry. I would promised Pastor Sandra that I'll have some, but I did, it wasn't ready. Uh, we still had some editing to do. And um, it's called Common Mistakes That Women Make. And I have 50 mistakes that we make, some of them very detrimental to us. And I thought that um, if women could learn from my mistakes and the other mistakes that... Uh, the older women have gone through them, we can save some of the young ones. But unfortunately, young people, you don't listen. Just as we thought, you know, you always think it won't happen to you. We thought so too, and it happened. Amen? And I keep telling people, if you start wrong, you can't end right. Uh, anyhow, first book, Building Authentic Apostolic Prophetic Associations. I think Apostle Vivian will probably talk about that. And it gives us a real sense of what this whole apostolic prophetic thing is all about that people make so mysterious. This one is fostering and forging apostolic communities and I wrote and it, it tells me how I should function in a church. What are my rights and what are my responsibilities when I belong to a church? Nikiva, God called her help. Adam called her woman and that's the problem. God never called us women. He said I will make a help for man. But because Adam, I don't know, he was starstruck with the beauty of Eve. She was naked. And she was perfect, ladies. If there was a perfect woman, Eve had to be it. Amen. And so Adam was a little confused. 
and only talked about the body. He said, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. He didn't talk about her mind. He didn't talk about anything else. And from that point, we are looked on primarily as flesh and bone, and that's the reality. That's what you're judged for first. People, even when somebody's attracted to you, it's because of how you look. Yeah, oh, Lord, let me go, go and sit down, because these people here, come on. Hello. So he loved you for your brains. Yeah. So the first time he saw you, he analyzed your brains, and he saw that you were intelligent. All right, you know, good. So a Bajan men here, love for brains. Yeah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We will send some of the Trini guys here to learn. It's after he gets to know you, he finds out what's inside here. Amen. And all the men say? Oh. This book is for... <laughs> I am an able man, and it's, it's really just an excellent book for men, showing you that um, uh, where God wants your enablement. In, if you look at the book cover closely, those of you who have the book, you will see a man's head, but with a, uh, his bicep muscles inside the head. And that's where we want the muscles, ladies. If you're looking for a good man, find out if he has muscles in his head. <laughs> Hallelujah. You want him to flex the muscles up inside here? Because, I mean, when you go on the beach in Barbados, you see enough of them all greased up. The chest as big as mine, and they only jump in. And when you look inside here, nada zilch. I tell women, if you get a combination of both, oh boy, you strike gold. Amen. But a, an able man is a man who first has his ability up inside there. Amen. And then... Well, we have many more books there, but for, for today, Call Covered Crown, The Anatomy of a Dream, all of us have a dream inside of us. How do you negotiate a dream? So many people die with their dreams inside of them. But we have come out of our own personal experiences, how we navigated. We, it was hard, very difficult. We, were, we didn't know. We didn't have people to help us along. And out of our experience, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We took the time to write to tell you that how you and your children could navigate your dream and fulfill it. I look forward to being here with you for this week. God bless all of you. Hallelujah. Good. We are extremely honored, we count it like that, to be able to come to your conference two years in, in succession to minister. As we said to your apostles, it has to be that we deposited something last year. So we are back again. But we are looking forward to see God, and I say God, but that is if you allow him to implement change in our lives. Where does change begin? That's the big question. But I just want us to wave to Divine Destiny Worship Center in Diego Martin, Faisabad, Sangre Grande, Chaguanas, out in Antigua, and all our connections in various parts of the world, Canada and other places, and just, just tell them, be ready for change. Because we, because we are changing. Okay, God bless you. And first thing I'll do is change my position. Hallelujah. Change my location. And later on, I'll change my jacket. Because this is just for pictures. Because it's crazy to wear jackets at this time. Hallelujah. But you have to look. Hello. You have to look. Amen. Good. Let me, let me read something from this book just to set the tone. And we're talking about change. Tell your neighbor, change really has to take place here first. And point your hand towards the, your head. Change has to take place here first. Because the theme this year is living Let's read the, the theme together. Living according to heaven. Living according to 
heaven. But where are we supposed to do that? Here in the earth. Now, if we were in heaven, living in heaven, there'll be no problem. But here we are being challenged. Thank you very much, sir. God will bless your heart. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I, I pray that the SUV you are looking for, it comes Amen. your way. In the name of Jesus. Amen. It shall come. Praise God. Hallelujah. Right. So I'm saying that if we were in heaven being challenged to live like heaven, according to heaven, then it will be easy. But to live heaven while living in the earth is not as easy as you think. Because there are other earthlings who don't want to live heaven while in the earth. Let me narrow it down. There are other earthlings in church that will not allow you to live heaven in church in the earth. And the reason for that is that as we grow, as we quote-unquote mature, and I'm putting heavy quotation uh, 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 um, signs around that, because maturity is not what you say. Is what you prove when tested. I'll say it again. Maturity is not a claim that you can make unless when you have been tested, you pass the test. Are you hearing me? So it doesn't come by age. Because there are 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds who still behave childish. There are people saved for 30 years and they still behave childish. They have not yet taken the principle that uh, Paul lived by. He said, when I was a child, I did what? I spake as a child, but now that I've become a man. Now that I have what? Uh, he didn't just say now that I am. He said now that I have become. Because maturity or maturing is a process. Tell your neighbor that for me. Maturing is a process. Anytime you're talking about process, you're talking about change along the assembly line. Really, we got to understand that. Because if we do not allow for the change that comes by way of processing, we will get to the end of the assembly line and be the same as we was when we started. And that is a frustration both for you because you who did not mature during the process, when you come to the, uh, to the end of the line where you are supposed to be on display, you'll realize you don't have the wear at all to display the right behavior that comes at the end. But it's also a frustration for other people. You see, if you were frustrated by yourself, that'll be all right. But I found that frustration is contagious. Well, I also found that immaturity is contagious. It affects other people. When you are always nyanyanyan and crying and, and you're, you're always complaining, other people are subject to that nasty air that's around you. It comes up, upon us too. If I'm always negative in, at home and I'm always curling and, 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 and whatever, do you know I am not the only one affected? Apostle Gemma is going to be affected. The neighbors are going to be affected. Because once you begin to speak, yesterday we were talking about that. Once you begin to speak, you actually command the molecules that float around you waiting on your command to shape your day, to shape your, your, your atmosphere, to shape the conditions in which you would live. If you're talking about living according to heaven, then you cannot be operating as though you're an earthling living according to the earth. It will not happen. And you will get frustrated. I will get frustrated. 
your pastor will get frustrated and God will get frustrated. Oh yes, God was frustrated many times. He said, Moses, just move out the way. Let me take these people out for I am fed up with their complaints. And of course, Moses did something that all leaders do. He stood before God and interceded and said, God, if you take them out now, what will the people, the heathens say about me and about you that we could not sustain them? Later on, Moses didn't make it to the promised land because of the same people. They frustrated the daylight out of Moses. Till Moses end up hitting Jesus before his time. Do you know the rock was Jesus? And only once was Jesus supposed to be uh, put, uh, allowed to suffer pain. That was in Pilate's judgment, judgment hall going right up to Calvary. But they got Moses so frustrated. You know why? Let me tell you why. God was taking them to heaven. Canaan was like heaven. He said in Canaan it would be flowing with what? Milk and honey. Everything going to be sweet. You read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, and other chapters. It says when you get to Canaan and you live in houses that you did not build and you own flock that you did not rear. It says just remember who gave it to you. Which simply means that part of the promise that God gave to Israel was this. I'm going to cause you to live in a state, not just in a land, but a state. When you're talking about living in a state, you're talking about a mindset that could actually appreciate the goodness of God. And not just appreciate the goodness of God, but actually take that appreciation to the point where all you want to do is please him. All you want to do is love him. All you want to do is worship him. All you want to do is let people all over know that this is my God that did this thing in me. But what happened? Israel was heading to Canaan and watch me well. They were heading to Canaan Looking back at Egypt. They say, if you don't look where you're going, you will go where you're looking. Tell anybody that for me. You better look where you're going or else you'll go where you're looking. So if you're heading to Canaan, looking back at Egypt, then Egypt still controls your mind. So to say we're going to be living according to heaven, we're going to have to detach our minds from what earthlings do. Now that is a challenge. You see, I'm sure your apostles and us who are going to be speaking to you really desire that this convention does not run what they call the run of the mill. Or it's a thing we do every year at this time. Then it will be a wasted investment in time, resources, and people. To come out of this convention on Friday and for about three weeks to a month, whatever we said and whatever happened be the buzzword. But the further away we get from the conference is the least we remember. I may tell the word remember simply means to celebrate. The least celebration. We go, we go less and less and less until we forget that there was a convention that said living according to heaven. And we begin to treat people just like we were on the 17th of, February, of, um, of July. 
Because one of the things I really want to, 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 to impress on you is that whatever you claim to have inculcated within you, it will be tested. If you say from, from, from today, I'm going to live heaven in the earth. I'm going to live according to heaven. Immediately you get tested. Because one of the things about heaven is that heaven is, heaven is a forgiving place. Tell your neighbor that for me. If you say you're going to live heaven in the earth and you cannot forgive people and you refuse to forgive people, then you are fooling yourself and you are frustrating God. Because whenever God allows a teaching to be done, he is expectant that, that those who have heard will put the words into action. Are you hearing me? And uh, this week in the sessions that I will, I will teach, I'll be exploring some of the, 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 the elements that we need to first identify and then deal with so decisively that at the end of uh, the, the, the whole season that we are in. In fact, before the season ends, there is a measurable, visible change in us. So tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I want change, and I also want to be changed. Tell another neighbor that for me. Neighbor, I want change, and I also want to be changed. Good, so here goes. Where does the change lodge itself? Where is the change supposed to be operative? It's in my mind. How does this change take place? I first have to identify, dismantle, then reconfigure my mind. So let me read this. A mindset is a mental attitude or fixed state of mind and way of thinking. Allow me to submit to you that a person's mindset or way of thinking is determined by the body of knowledge to which he or she has been exposed and the consequence of experiences through which he has been. Since it is generally accepted that knowledge is power, it stands to reason that the more knowledge a person acquires on a particular subject, the more advantageous his position will be to pronounce on or take action on that matter. On the other hand, if one has limited or no information on any subject that presents itself for his consideration, his mind may not allow him to make the decision best suited for his advancement and that of others connected to him. And for me, that is the problem. If you doing nonsense, if I doing nonsense, that's all right. But I have to know that I, I, I am like, a, like a, a bicycle wheel. Spokes are going out connecting me to the tire outside. The tire represents all the people that know me. So I may, I may be snug, very smug in my, in my ignorance and, and, and basking in the fact that I don't need to know all those things. But what about the people connected to you? Many people are waiting for you to experience the change. And they will take from you. You got to know it. I've seen it happen so many times. They interview these sportsmen. And at, the, 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 the reporter says... Um, so you're going to be the role model to the youths. And the person re rudely answers, me, I'm not anybody role model, I am me. But the fact that you are out where the lights are, the fact that you are where people are seeing you, people take pattern from whomever they look at, whether good or bad. Therefore, the responsibility for change from living like an earthling in the earth, even though I'm saved, to living according to heaven 
while I'm in the earth. That responsibility is even more onerous from the point of view your child is expecting you to change. Your neighbor is expecting you to change. Your co-workers are looking for the change. They are hearing about the convention and they hear that you must live according to heaven. You don't dare go to work tomorrow and raise hell. No, if you go tomorrow and raise hell, then something is wrong not with the gospel, but with your appreciation and your appropriation plus implementation of the gospel. Because the gospel is not something to preach, it's something to live. Tell the neighbor that for me. Not something to preach, it's something to live because the gospel means good news. Do you know, when you walk into your office tomorrow, you are either bringing good news or bad news just by coming? All right, let, let, let's bring it to this evening. When you go back home, you are supposed to bring good news or the gospel Without even having a megaphone saying, hear you, hear you, all these sinners, you need to be saved. No, just walking back home, living in that neighborhood, according to heaven, that's gospel. They are looking for change. But I cannot impact them for change until I am changed. Are you hearing me? And I'll keep harping on this for the entire week because we want change, but we don't want to be changed. Right now in Trinidad, the, 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 the crazy season is on. That's election time, and it's getting hotter and hotter. And every, lots of people are saying, let's change the government because in 2010, everybody says, let's change the government. We want change. We want change. We had a change of government. And we're still asking for change. And we're planning to change this one. But if we don't change, we're going to have the same thing again. Because change begins with me. Tell your neighbor that way. If I am looking for change, I desire change, then I must allow myself first to be changed. So, what needs to be changed? Our mindset. We need to do what? Change our mindset. Change our way of thinking. In Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7, it says what? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man does what? Thinks in his heart, so is he. No, 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 no. Most of us uh, uh, think that thinking is done up here. Yes, it's done here at the first level. But the real core of our being where the change must take place is in our heart. We, I found out when I was doing a series about uh, um, using uh, Proverbs 4.23, which says, guard your heart. Because out of it comes the issues of life. I found out that there is a brain in your heart that's more powerful than the brain in your head in fact it is said that the brain in your head is the servant of the brain in your heart that is why you cannot really fulfill purpose unless you get your heart not your head in it I wanted to catch that you cannot fulfill your divine mandate unless your heart is in it. The brain in your heart has more power than the one in your head. That's why one time Jesus and his disciples were going down the road and, and there were some people singing praises unto Jesus. And the disciples said, but Jesus, look, they're singing praises and they're not with us. What about that? Jesus said, hello. He said, they are worshiping me, but their hearts are not in it. And, and, may I, and may I tell you, may I tell you then, may I tell you then, 
Now you could be in new dimension or divine destiny where the worship is so deep it moves people from their seats to the front. Some people fall out. Some people get knocked out. I mean, some people just worship with everything they have. And yet, there are those who will be in the building but not worshiping. There are those in the building who stood, will stand up for the hour with their mouth zip. There are those in the building who will see movement up front, but they will be standing, some up front here, some in the back, and they do nothing to make God know. Because if you're talking about living according to heaven, one of the key things you will realize is that heaven is built on worship. Tell your neighbor that for me. Heaven is built on worship. Heaven is not even built on intercession. There'll be nobody praying in heaven. Heaven is not built on preaching. There'll be nobody preaching in heaven. Heaven is not built on witnessing and evangelism. Heaven is built on worship. The only thing John saw them doing in heaven was worshiping. Where are the worshipers? No, I'm not talking about the thousand and something of us here. I'm talking about you. Are you a worshiper? If you're not a worshiper, then living according to heaven could never be a reality in your life. Oh, well, I, I'm not too emotional. I'm a cool guy. I don't really get into all that stuff. And when you go up there, it's only emotion. Because some jump in. And I, I like my partner. I saw him today. He tell God, God, I'm worshiping you with my violin. Don't laugh at him, you know. Dwight is his name. Don't laugh at Dwight, you know. Dwight gets into the thing, and the thing is into him. You see, one of the laments, one of the laments of the, of the housewife or the, the, the house husband too who could cook, and all the house husbands who could cook say, hey, fellas, don't leave me out here by myself now. Hello, all the men who could cook say, and those who can't cook but will learn to cook say, Well, let's leave me out here with the fish by myself. No, no, no. One of the laments is this, that, that the fish you're about to bake or fry came from a salted environment. But you don't dare eat it without putting salt in it. So there is the fish in the salt, but the salt never gets into it. There are people in the church, in the worship, but the worship never gets into them. There are people who will be in the atmosphere of heaven, but heaven never gets in. That's a lament. That's a lament that God has. Every time New Dimension meets, especially on a Sunday, heaven is, has strained its radar on you. And there are certain sounds that only New Dimension makes. When we worship in divine destiny, that's a special sound that God is waiting on. It's both a corporate song with all the voices, but he also listens to the individual. Is it coming from your head or is it coming from your heart? Or is it coming at all? And that is why when, when, when individuals in the kingdom who begin to live according to heaven begin to look blessed and begin to walk blessed and live blessed, Others get jealous of them. But you got to know the price that they had to pay. They had to worship in spite of their feelings. They had to worship in spite of what happened at home. They had to worship in spite of having no money right now. But they worship with an expectation. They sow the seed of worship. And they know eventually all heaven's treasures will come their way. Somebody shout glory. Oh, hallelujah. That's why in the kingdom, you don't, <laughs> there's no room for jealousy. Everybody has the same chance. Everybody has the same opportunity. Everybody has the same rights. But who exercise the rights, those are the ones that will walk out looking like heaven. Because I, I, I'm about to get somebody, some people even more crazy. I, I'm about to get some people even more annoyed with me. 
Because I want to, I want to drop this on you. Our mindset is formed and informed by our history. By our what? By our what? Now, our history is, oh, as, as, as West Indians, our history is almost the same as Israel. Israel was in slavery. Therefore, <laughs> Israel actually cultured, in fact, let me next week. Slavery actually cultured a particular way of thinking. In the Israelites. That even when they got their emancipation. As I said they were heading to Canaan. Looking back at the slave fields. And looking back their means. They were going forward. But they were being informed by. Controlled by. They were being uh, uh, pushed by what they experienced. One of the, the challenges concerning change is to cut loose from where you were held in a state of being and begin to think according to where you're going. If you are given a scholarship to France, Anybody here who may get a scholarship to France? You don't wait until you land in Paris to find out what is the meaning of bread. What is the word for bread? What is the word for water? What is the word for... Well, you, you like sausage? What is the word for sausage? What is the word for meat? What is the word for rice? Huh? What is the word for room? Hotel room? Or whatever. No, since... If, if, if the scholarship is going to be uh, activated in January, all now, you're only listening to French radio, boy, from Guadeloupe, boy. Oh, yes, you're only practicing your French on your mother, boy. Mama, Mama, comment allez-vous? I hear her. What? Mama, comment allez-vous? Comment allez-vous? Allez-vous? Because wherever you are heading, you first have to speak the language of that place. Are you hearing me? <laughs> why? Because language orders your world. That's why God gave us language to set order in our world. And let me, let, let me prove to you how it happens. <laughs> when you go back home, Without even having put labels on certain doors to certain rooms, those rooms have certain functions because of their names. There's one called kitchen. There's one called toilet. Now, have you ever... <laughs> peeled your potato while sitting on your throne? Unless you're cooking for yourself. <laughs> Why? Because immediately as you feel hungry, you go, kitchen. That's the order of life. It means immediately as your colon begins to speak to you, you go, toilet. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh, in Barbados, there was bathroom. You go to the bathroom. But please, don't turn on the shower. When is the colon? Uh, uh, anyway. Well then, if I am going to live according to heaven, I have to find out the language of heaven. What's the language of heaven? May I tell you, uh, I'm looking for a, cloth, uh, uh, a paper Bible. Who have a paper Bible? Paper Bible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know where you find the language of heaven? It's in the Bible. Surprise, surprise. 
Oh no, 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 let me make it prophetic. Thus said the Lord, Shando, lo, 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 shende. God is the one who speaks the language of heaven. And he wrote it in a book. 66 volumes of it. Between two covers, a front and a back. Beginning with Genesis. Anybody ever heard about Genesis? That's heaven telling us how we started. Anybody ever heard about Revelations? That's heaven telling us how we're going to end. Anybody ever heard about Isaiah, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon? That's heaven speaking to us on how to live heaven in the earth. And then ask your neighbor with a very honest face. When last did you read the book that has the language of heaven? Or do you wait until you come to church to see whether a man of God will say, open the Bible? I, and I'm driving to something. Because Israel, even when they got into Canaan, continued to operate as children. Children who were locked into the onion fields. Locked into the slave market in Israel. But notice that God actually expected Israel to mature from the moment they crossed Jordan. From Exodus until Deuteronomy, they are called and referred to as the children of Israel. From the time they crossed Jordan, they are no longer labeled as children of Israel. The writers deliberately dropped children off. And from then on, they are called Israel. What was the sense? It was the sense that by then, having crossed the waters, having been baptized one more time, they are, were supposed to walk into maturity. But the slave mentality continued. Well, here what happened with us, Caribbean people. We are descendants of slaves. Tell your neighbor, I just heard something that is mind-blowing. No, you see, hear what happened with us. Because we take things for granted, we don't see the impact, sometimes negative, on our lives. When in 1834, slavery was abolished, it was only legal slavery. But psychological slavery was not. 100 and let me see this 2015. 175 years later, no, 85 years later, we are still locked into the plantation. And may I tell you, plantation slavery was not heaven, it was hell. Plantation slavery was what? Hell. But may I tell you, plantation slavery was actually endorsed by religion. In fact, let me tell you, when, when Noah came out of the flood, Noah became a farmer, and he was mainly a grape farmer. A grape farmer. And one day what he did, after reaping the grapes, he and his sons brewed wine. And Noah gouged himself on wine. He drank wine until he got drunk. Until he got what? 
Until he got what? Say that for me. Noah drank wine and got drunk. When you get drunk, you get stupid. You become a slave to the alcohol. Hear me well. Hear what it did to him. It made him strip himself naked. You have to be drunk to walk around naked. He fell asleep naked. And one of his three sons, the middle son, Ham, saw him naked. Hear me well. Saw him naked. And instead of covering him, what he did was expose him to his two other brothers. Noah, by way of analogy, was Ham's apostle. He was Ham's father. He was Ham's leader. He was Ham's progenitor. He was Ham's connection to God. So the big question, what do you do if you see your leader naked? If you're going to live according to heaven, you're going to have to bring a cover and keep it to yourself. Cover it in your heart. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you before the week is out, this is our problem. This is our problem. We live in the church, but we live according to religion. The same thing that enslaved us before we got saved. Because when we're living according to religion, all we see is sin and no forgiveness. Once we see sin, we're ready to expose it. Because I'm righteous because you are sinful. But righteousness is not judged by somebody else's unrighteousness. It's judged according to the language of the book. And when the king of heaven was in, uh, in the earth, even though the book said to stone the prostitute, he said to the people who had the stones ready, guns loaded, SMG. You say, you could stone them, yes, stone her, yes. But just check your records. Do you have anything that looks like what you want to stone her for? And Jesus went and wrote a book in the sand. Huh. Whatever he wrote there, when them guys saw what he was writing, they said, If we're going to live according to heaven and earth, we cannot walk around with a bag of stones. That's earthling behavior. I know some people, when you saw that title, you expected that this morning I'll be talking about how God going to bless you with three SUVs. There are no SUVs in heaven. Oh, God will give you five houses. Up in heaven, Jesus says he's building the houses and he will not download them to the earth. So Mr. Ham goes to his brothers and says, Shem, Japheth, look daddy naked. Tell your neighbor, gossip is a terrible thing, you know. Listen, even though it's factual, even though it's factual, you have WhatsApp pictures to prove. Shut your mouth. You cannot uncover your father's nakedness. You're looking for trouble. But in here, let's, let's, let's fast track. What did Shem and Japheth do? They got a cloth. And they walked backwards based on the location that Ham said. And when they knew they had come right up to where their father was, they put down the cloth over him. 
even though Noah was asleep. Because Noah was a prophet. He knew exactly what happened while he was asleep. And he said, when he got up, to Shem and Japheth, you are blessed. Your generation is going to be blessed. But he said to Ham, he said, Ham, because you did not cover me when I was naked. Go right there in Genesis chapter 8 and 9 and you'll see. He said, you will not suffer the curse, but your son Canaan. In other words, what you did, your generations will be cursed. And the children of Canaan are going to be slaves or servants to Shem and Japheth. I want you to hear me well. And it is said, based on biblical geography and history, that Shem migrated from the area around Iran and went north to reside. Japheth stayed in that area and spread east. As he multiplied. And it's, 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 it's accepted based on genetics that Shem's descendants, because they went not into temperate countries, began to develop a pigmentation that corresponded to where they were. So they became Caucasoid or Caucasians better known as whites. Japheth's people remained in the Middle East there and some spread east. Some became the East Indians, the Chinese, the Mongoloids, the Arabs. But they said Ham's migration was south and it is said he ended in Africa. Which in the scripture you'll see Ethiopia, but that's, that's a, 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 a generic term for all of Africa. And because it, the, the location is mainly tropical, the pigmentation that was developed was dark skin. Are you hearing me? When Columbus came to the Caribbean and discovered this vast, I mean, well, at least he began the process of discovery because other people came and went to South America, further down South America, some uh, uh, cross Panama, the Panama, uh, the Isthmus of Panama, and saw the Pacific Ocean and so on. When they saw the type of potential it had for agriculture, lift your right hand up. Lift your right hand up. I know I'm, what I'm telling you. I just saw that angel that is assigned to us wherever we go to minister. I just saw the angel. God says to me, every time you are speaking my word, I will endorse it by the presence of that angel. I'll cause that angel to break the spirit barrier and cause him to become visible so you will know that I am endorsing what you're speaking. And I prophesy right now in this house by the power of the Most High God that the angel of the Lord has come to liberate us of the chains of slavery that keep us from living heaven in the earth. I prophesy by your th God's authority. I declare that there is a rain, an acidic rain that's falling upon us from glory to actually melt and remove the chains on our minds. How are we going to walk out of this place with a different level of freedom before this day is out? In the name of Jesus. Somebody say, Lord, I receive my freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So hear me. I told you I will get a lot of people angry with me, but that's all right. What I found is that when you are confronted with knowledge that you did not know, if you, if you can't accept it, if you can't believe it, then you will never receive it anyway. Because I found that you only learn what you believe. If all of us learned what we were taught, 
all of us will be so bright. But in school, you didn't believe one and one make two. So now we can't do the maths. Neither did you believe the teacher. You see, <laughs> it's not just what I'm saying. You have to believe me for what I'm saying for you to learn from what I'm saying. Are you hearing me? Because lots of people, lots of people read God's word, but they're not going to speak in terms of God. That's why we learn nothing. Oh, yeah, we read the whole Bible in a year. You're right. Okay. All right. Show me the Bible in motion. Because we didn't believe God when he said, forgive the one that hurt us. And you know, I'm a pastor. When he said, pay tithes. Oh, that's Old Testament. You don't pay the tithes and you're coming for a pastor to open the windows of heaven on your behalf. You want God to kill him. Because he is operating illegally if you don't pay tithes and you come to ask God, ask him to pray to God that you get to pay your debts. You see, if we're talking about living heaven in the earth, we have to read over the Bible, boy. And begin to live it. But let me continue. All right, I hope you, everybody got pictures of the, the jacket on me. Because now I'll be taking it off. Hallelujah. Good. So let's continue. Hear this. When Europe decided to do agriculture and to extract the riches of the Western world, they were looking for labor. They needed labor because at that time, they didn't have the machines that we have now. They were looking for labor. You know where they decided to go? Somebody say Africa. They went to Africa. And they actually went into the Bible, Genesis chapter 9, and found out that the people who lived in Africa were descendants of Ham. And took it as their right. Because they were descendants of Shem. To come and enslave the Africans. And bring them to the Caribbean. I want you to hear me well. But hear this. Hear this. When they got to Africa. They found out that even Ham's descendants were enslaving their own people. Therefore, slave trade was easy. All they had to do was pit one tribe against another tribe, and that tribe that was given some little trinkets went into the interior and took entire families, brought them to the coast, and put them on the little boats and took them to the big ships that brought them to Barbados and Trinidad and Antigua and all the other places. I want you to hear me well. It was not difficult for them because Ham's people were already enslaving one another. I found out that people are people everywhere. It doesn't matter color, era, or history. So, hear me well. Because even in the church of Jesus Christ, there are people who have learned the art of enslaving others. And are using religion as their justification. Do you know there was a time when you couldn't read the Bible? If you were in a certain religion, if you were found out, they will excommunicate you. In fact, they hid the truth of the Bible in the language in which it was written, Latin. And everybody believed what the priest from Ireland said. Almost go with home, 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 
And everybody bows, yes, Father, that is true. And they even know what he's saying, but then he goes, Yes, Father, that is true. Okay, come and get your, your host, for this is Jesus Christ. When you chew him, you'll be chewing Jesus, and you'll swallow Jesus. Come. Thank you, Father. But you cannot have the wine. I will drink on your behalf. Yes, Father, that is true. And if you were caught reading that book, the people who translated the Bible into English, William Tyndale and those guys, they lost their heads. Some were locked in the jails. When Martin Luther discovered, yes, I don't have to be enslaved by a religion. I could access God by faith. They said, what, you too liberated? They jailed him, excommunicated him as a priest, and he ended up in jail. I want you to hear me, because we're driving to living heaven in the earth. To live heaven in the earth, religion cannot be a factor in the equation. Because religion go together with slavery in the place in Ghana where the, it, it was called the point of no return. Where they loaded the slaves at Port Elmina. Downstairs was the port. Upstairs was a church. While the Africans were being hoarded into boats, herded into boats, beaten because they don't want to go. Because some of the Africans who, from whom we descended, they were actually princes and kings they, they were princesses they understood nobility and how to walk in authority they were now being herded in a little ship in a hole too small for the amount of them but the slave masters operated by the law of averages if we pack a hundred people in this hole maybe about 30 might die between now and Time we land in Barbados, but at least we'll have 70. They didn't care. And what happened? Upstairs, the priest, the representative of religion, who claimed to be a representative of God, who claimed to be justified in doing this because of what he read in the Bible, he was blessing the slave masters for a safe trip. And for good sales for their slaves, for people. So they came across to the Caribbean and set up a community and <laughs> built the community based on a colonial system. The operative word in colonial is colon. You know what? You know, do you know what comes on a colon? So they made us feel like we are English, we speak English, or we speak French, so we made us feel like French, but they denied us the citizenship. Oh yes, we learned their language, but they didn't give us the finer things of England and France. In fact, if we dare, if we dared to speak the language with the same tone like them, you lost your tongue. Unless, of course, you were specially chosen as a house slave who they taught all the graces, how to eat with knife and fork and how to have tea at four in the evening. But that was for a plan. What was the plan? Teach them how to speak our language, but don't deny them their language. Send them among those who don't know our language, but whose language they know. And tell them to beat the drums just like them. Listen to what they're saying, but come back and tell us what they're planning. So they, they rule the plantation system by a principle called divide and rule. Pit one against the other, and you can control both. 
Well, I have news for you. That's what religion has done to God's church. So you have people who are called full gospel who will never identify with this man. Why? Because we don't believe what he believes. We don't believe in apostles. We are bishops. So when, if ever there's a, a calling together of the church, unless he called it, it ain't coming. And I, I, I want you to understand that religion always went with slavery. That is why, that is why it was religion out of which Jesus brought you. So you could get freedom in the church. But I found out if you stay churchy, if all you do is claim to be part of the church, religion like a poison ivy vine will gradually wend this way through the windows and the doors and grab hold of you and you'll be in church but never enslaved. You'll still be enslaved. Heaven is anti-slavery. Heaven is an emancipator. But that's the problem. The last station uh, in my profession as a teacher was uh, teaching form six at A levels. I taught um, West Indian history. And when I, I, that was my pet area, uh, uh, slavery and so on, the, the emancipation of slaves. And we found out based on history that many people, even after slavery was abolished because nobody told them they were free, continued to work for their slave masters. And the slave masters made them none the wiser. Because once your mind is set in a particular way, it's difficult to respond even to a legal document. You first have to get somebody to speak it into your spirit. And we are here this week to speak it into your spirit. You don't have to be enslaved by earth's way of doing things. Because when the king of heaven came to earth, he laid out heaven's plan. So here it is. As I said, there's a correlation between religion and slavery. But there's also a correlation between slavery and culture. Slavery, culture, and religion, slavery, culture, religion, and history, all of them are in the same boat, in the same person. And even when you come to this altar and you bawl and you cry, and you say, Lord have mercy upon me, a sinner. Pastor lay hands on you and you fall down. You say, pick up, pick up. You fall down again, pick him up, pick him up. You fall down again, you take a keg of oil, pour it on your head. Oil will run down your head, down your beard to your toe. But if it doesn't seep into your mind, you're going to be the same thing. Needing deliverance all the time. Are you hearing me? So hear this. When Jesus came to the earth, tell your neighbor Jesus came from heaven. Tell your neighbor Jesus came from heaven. Tell your neighbor again Jesus came from heaven. And then tell your neighbor this. So if anybody knows about how to live heaven in the earth, Jesus certainly does. Jesus certainly does. Therefore, if I want to live heaven in the earth or live according to heaven in the earth, I have to follow what Jesus did and what he said, what he laid down as principles, what he laid down as, as his action. Because he didn't just speak it, he acted it out. Are you hearing me? Being a member of a church does not guarantee you live like heaven. Being filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that's no guarantee. Because out in the Old Testament, I don't see anywhere they spoke in tongues, but Abraham lived heaven in the earth. David lived heaven in the earth. <laughs> I found that Job lived heaven in the earth to the point that God began to boast about him. And I don't see where Job spoke in tongues. You see, many people speak in tongues just to satisfy the curiosity and some again just to make pastor not call them up the next time he call in for all those who didn't speak in tongues. At least he saw me the first time. Because, and all I did was go shuku, ruku, ruku, shuku, ruku, shando, londo, halo, shaka, luya. Good. 
At least he heard me speak. So next time when I don't come up, he can't tell me don't come. Those things don't impress God. I say your tongue talking doesn't impress God. Even your tithes giving don't impress God. I say even your praying don't impress God. You can sing as loud as you want. It doesn't impress God. Because God looks at your heart. It's your heart that has to be heavenly. So here it is. So Jesus comes down to earth. And there are some words that are connected to Jesus. Redeemer. Who came to redeem us. Reconciler. Who came to reconcile us. Revive. Who came to institute a revival. Resurrector. Who came to give us resurrection? The operative uh, element in all those words is the re. Anybody know what re means? Uh, this looks like a bright side over here. What does re mean? To do it again. Now, 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 how is it possible to have to do something again if it was not done before? Oy. Well, then it tells me that living according to heaven was already established in the earth, but something messed it up so that the king of heaven had to come and re-establish it. Therefore, therefore, I dare say, if it is uh, according to what God said, then it is present in and evident in the Bible. So this is not some strange uh, concoction that man of God got. No, this is God saying to us here in uh, New Dimension, in Barbados, uh, at large, in Trinidad, in, in Antigua, and wherever else people are listening to us. He's saying, I want to reconnect you to how life used to be. I want to bring you back to the place that you're entitled to be. And it doesn't matter if the descendants of Shem had enslaved you. That is immaterial. It doesn't matter if religion like cobweb still holds you from accessing the fullness of God. He said, that's immaterial. He said, but when I show up, if you believe me, then your freedom will come. But you have to believe me because you cannot believe, you cannot live what I teach if you don't believe me, the teacher. If you don't believe the teacher, you will not believe what the teacher is saying. And if you don't believe what the teacher is saying, there will be no change and the teacher is speaking. And the teacher is saying, I want to reconnect you to the original plan. He said, think it not strange. Don't feel strange if you decide to want to walk like how Adam walked. When Adam was here, I was in Adam. You were in Adam. I keep saying that we only bear affinity to Adam from the point of his fall. But you can't fall if you were not up. Therefore, if I fell with Adam, I had to be up when Adam fell. Huh? And what were some of the signs of Adam in the earth? Adam lived in an embassy of heaven. It's called Eden. Do you know what Eden means? The word Eden means pleasure. The first thing God expected us to do was to enjoy life. Uh, let me tell these youths here so that when you grow up, you will not live like how those people who got saved so long, they forgot that God is a liberator. God expected us to enjoy life. God still expects us to enjoy life. God expects if you do due diligence, you do all that is supposed to be done, you're supposed to enjoy the fruits of your labor. God expects if you studied your work, you passed your exam, and you are now employed, your money is supposed to help you to live the good life. And don't believe no religious folks who tell you, all I need is my Jesus. I don't need nothing else. I don't need no house. I don't need no car. I don't need no husband. I don't need no wife. Hey, boy, hey, hey, don't listen to them, please. That's enslavement. Because I hear in the presence of God, there is what? 
fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore and I have heard that the king of heaven he came down to bring me back into the presence of God and once I'm in the presence of God which is not limited to church walls and religious doctrines I'm supposed to be enjoying my life so here it is Here comes the king of heaven. He comes to earth. And he has one plan. That is to bring man back to where it used to be. So in John chapter 10, he profiles himself as the good shepherd. He is not just, as David says, the Lord is my shepherd. By the time he gets to the New Testament, he is the good shepherd. He says, every other shepherd is a hireling. Everybody else who's trying to rule your life, and tell you what you're going to eat and can't eat and where you're going to go and you can't go. He said, those are hirelings. And when trouble starts, they will run and leave you alone. He said, but I'm the good shepherd. I've come to give you the good life. And he didn't just say, I've come to give you the good life. He actually compared our lives as they are with how they're supposed to be. In John 10.10. 10, he said what? The thief. Uh, put that up on the, on the board for me. Because I want people to see it for themselves. Because some people didn't bring their Bible today. <laughs> now it's so easy to carry a Bible. Your cell phone, download the app called Version Bible. There are 700 and something versions of the Bible inside there in different languages. So you don't have to tote the big Bible to feel shame. Because long time, long time, when we, when we just got saved, Bible, right? Bible, Bible. We used to walk so. Now all you do is pin it on your belt. Your Bible inside there. Different translation. And some people still manage to come to church without a Bible. I don't understand that. L let's read. The thief... Does not come except to what? And to what? And to what? And I'm telling you, he did a good number on us when we were in Adam. And isn't it funny that Jesus is called the second Adam? It means there was one before, right? But he's not just the second Adam. He's the original Adam that sent out the first Adam in human form. And then he came as the second Adam to tell us how to live the real heaven life like Adam was supposed to live. Somebody give God a praise for that. He said, I have come. Read it for me. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more. I mentioned to the uh, um, troop yesterday that, hello, he didn't say the most abundant life, although most is an immeasurable amount. By, by, by man's thinking, but it is limited because once you reach the extreme, that's it. More abundant is an open-ended way of living. He said, I've come to give you a life that will ever expand in its coverage, in its joy, in its value, in its power, and everything else you could think about that heaven uh, downloads earth, your life will open up and have all of that. It's important to understand that because religion has taught us if you're too joyful, you're carnal. If you're enjoying the fineries of life, you are carnal. You should have sold all that and give it to the poor. Here the religious disciple of Jesus, Judas, who ended up selling out Jesus. Oh, all that money she spent for that, buy that alabaster box of spike nut, uh, um, uh, we, we call it perfume, it's a waste of money. Should have sold it and given the money to the poor. So concerned about the poor, yet he sold out Jesus. And Jesus didn't even uh, bother with the fact that he was stealing money. Jesus said, hello, the poor we'll always have with us. So stop worrying about the poor. 
And in, in parentheses it says, for the Lord knew he was stealing from the purse. Which tells me you could be that close to heaven. Oh, I got a, I got a part of this. I'll, I'll speak on, uh, on, um, on Thursday night. Is this heaven and hell in the same house? Heaven and hell dwelling in the same house. We'll talk about that. Watch this. Jesus has mandated that you live the good life. Tell your neighbor that for me. And tell your neighbor, a mandate is an order. He orders you to live heaven in the earth. That's the more abundant life. That's a life that has no measure. That's a life that has no end. That's a life that nobody could stop you from living. That's a life that who don't want it, you take it too. Are you hearing me? Good. So let's move on. Uh, I just have a few more points to lay, and then tomorrow night we will expand it. So Jesus comes to the earth. And Jesus shows up in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. What's the name of the town? The city Caesarea, which means it's a town built in honor of Caesar. Built in honor of Caesar. Where were the Caesars located? From what and from what city did they rule? Where were they located? In Rome. They were, it's not a trick question. Hey, is Rome, boy. Rome still there, boy. Rome. The Caesars operated from Rome. But they were not like any other world power. When other world powers before the uh, era of the Caesars in Rome captured another nation, what they did was bring selected people, young, bright people, from those cities into their city. But they had a logistical problem. What was the logistical problem? They had to find housing and they had to find food to feed all of them. And it proved to be a nightmare. And many times captives were slain because the, the ruling nation could not feed them. Or they were used in game shows with gladiators. They just wanted to get rid of them. But when Rome took over the world, the then known world, Rome implemented the same principle like Shem, the Shemites, the masters from Europe implemented in the Caribbean. They implemented a system called the colonial system. Colony. So Israel at the time of Jesus was a colony. At the, at the time of Jesus, sorry. Israel at the time of Jesus was a colony of Rome. Therefore, therefore, one of, the, one of the things that you learned, one of the things that you learned, oh Jesus, Lord have mercy. One of the things that you learned when you were in a colonial system is that you had to please the ruler of the mother country. Or else the mother country will send all the forces to take you out. And may I tell you, all those who were rulers in the colonial system were given instruments of authority to function on behalf of the ruler back in Europe. Here it is. It means then that in, in, in in Rome's colonial system, wherever Rome ruled, all the rules, all the orders, all the authorities came from the capital, Rome, and were sent down the colonial chute or the chute of the what? Of the colony. And by the time it got to where you were, it became messed up because the colon only carries mess. Yeah. 
Hear me well. What was one of the, the, the governmental instruments that Rome used? Rome used an instrument called the Ecclesia. The Ecclesia, according to the Greek, to rule cities on behalf of Caesar. And Caesarea was one such city. Named after Caesar to appease Caesar, to honor Caesar. But in Caesarea, at the main gate, above the gate, there was a chamber where selected or ecclesiastical or called out people were put to make rules and issue orders to run the city. So Jesus comes in Matthew 16 and in verse 13. He stands, I would say, opposite the house, which was also called a senate, like you have here in Barbados, we have in Trinidad. Those in the senate were not elected, they were selected, huh? specially chosen by the different authorities, opposition, um, ruling party, and your governor general. We have the president. And their, their rulings can even override what the House of Representatives sets as a rule. As a law, it first has, uh, after it's finished in the House of Representatives, the lower house, it must go to the upper house and be approved before it goes to the Governor General for signing or the President in Trinidad for signing. Until such time, it is not a law. Are you hearing me? So the Ecclesia made the rules for Caesarea and other such cities. That is why. That is why the religious folks use their law to convict Jesus, but depended on Caesar's law to crucify him. They convicted Jesus. They accused Jesus of desecrating their religion. And we'll talk some more about that tomorrow night. Because I found that religious people are fiercely defensive of their beliefs, but they are casual about what the king says. They will kill you for breaking one of their doctrines, but they never lift up the God that they say gave them authority to kill you. So hear this. Jesus stands up there and he says, disciples, Apostles, oh, well, uh, you just don't have enough time to, to break that down. Because I want you to know Jesus had disciples, thousands of them, 15,000. Because when he was sharing bread and fish, my God, the crowd just grew like that. Uh, tell your neighbor, is there a modern day e equivalent to that? That if it's a work day here at New Dimension, we're looking for people and can't find them. But if we have a eat out that the church sponsor, don't feel like how it happens in Trinidad too. But hear this. Jesus stands up, watches the ecclesia, watches the senate, what is the house where the decision makers were sitting? Who carried the authority to override Jewish laws in that city in Israel, Caesarea? And says this, whom do men say that I am? He's speaking to his apostles. Because out, eh, out of the 15,000 he went in Luke chapter 5, chapter 6, and chose 12 apostles. Because you cannot have heaven in the earth without governmental structure. Religion tells me I could do what I want when I come to church because I'm free. Heaven and earth says there is a government. We will talk some more about that tomorrow. Hear this. Jesus said, whom do men say that I am? I, the son of man, am. And the disciples who had 
chosen as apostles, governmental authority, supposed to be working on behalf of heaven, didn't even know who the king of heaven was among them. Watch this. They said, some are saying that you are John the Baptist, ridiculous, because John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Hello. Uh, some are saying you are Isaiah. Some are saying you are Elijah, and so on and so on and so on, or, or one of the prophets. Uh, 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 and Jesus said, okay, okay, scuttle all of that. Delete that. Whom do you, whom do you say that I am? And that is what I want you to know. Because we're finishing off around here right now, this morning. What does God mean to you? Is God personal to you? Or are you coming with the throng every Sunday religiously to church because this is a nice place to be? I could make some good hookups in this house. Because you got doctors and lawyers and managers of banks and so on. My daughter could get a good job when she finished CXC and whatever. Or do I come because I am connected to the king and all I want to do is be in his house? Because as we're going to learn uh, in the next five minutes that the church is heaven's embassy. So when I leave home, I'm coming to the embassy of the king. And when I'm in the embassy of the king, I'm given certain authorities. So when I walk out of the embassy to go into my own home, I could exercise those authorities. That no demon spirit could stay in my life. No obia. No doppy spirit could attack my children. Because I came to the embassy. And the ambassador, Ikaraba Shanda, handed to me by way of the word. A sword, a sure word with two edges. One edge to bless them that are from the embassy and the next edge to destroy demons. But if I don't understand that I walk in and I walk up just as I came and become even more frustrated when I go home because I thought change will happen when I came, not realizing I will only change when I learn what I believe. Everything else Apostle Duncan said this morning, uh, I don't believe all that stuff. So what do you believe? Uh, I know, I'll, I'll get it. Here. How much for the CD? Tw Twenty dollars. Nah, no, nah, no, nah, that is too much. Uh, that and nothing was the same thing. That's how many people are going to leave here today. You see, I, 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 I go to church, we preach, we watch, we watch people, and sometimes at the most crucial point of the service, their work at home becomes more important. It looms so large, they walk out of God's house and did not hear the conclusion of what God was saying. You ever read Ecclesiastes chapter 12? The last verse? Hear the wise man Solomon. This is the conclusion of the whole matter. Have you been in church for all the conclusions of the matter? You could be in the embassy and leave the embassy without knowing what the king says and what authorities you have because your home is more important. Isn't it amazing we don't walk out of work like that? We spend 10 hours at work. And if the boss says, I need somebody to work two hours more, you stay until six o'clock. But in church, you, we don't even start since eight or six. We don't even go until eight. We don't even go until four. And people are more concerned about the food they're cooking home. That is why religion is still enslaving us. We did the religious thing. We came to church on Sunday. Oh, of course, we wouldn't find you here on Friday or Wednesday because... Are tired from work. So we are more religious with our Sunday self. And we criticize the Adventists for their Saturday self. That is why we have little authority. Because we are supposed to be in the Ecclesia, the called out ones, the authority makers. But we don't stay until the instruments of authority are given to us. Let me finish up this. 
You need to read the message Bible of the next thing that Jesus says to his disciples. He said, whom do you say that I am? And the scripture says, and when he pressed them, which tells me the answer that Peter gave did not come automatically. He had to press them. In other words, they were sitting in front of him, supposedly had the advantage over everybody else because they were right in his presence, hearing him preach, looking at his facial expressions, feeling the anointing that's around him, seeing the miracles, and yet their minds were still locked into religion, describing him from a humanistic, religious point of view. He didn't expect that from them. So he pressed them and pressed them. Until Peter declared, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You are not just son of Joseph and Mary. You came from heaven. You came down here to do the heaven thing that used to be when Eden existed. You are the anointed one that came down with instruments of authority to destroy the yokes of slavery that were put around us. What happened? Jesus said, let's capture this. Where is he standing? Right opposite in view of the Senate, the Ecclesia of Caesarea, which was an embassy of Rome. Therefore, all the authorities of Rome were vested in. The, the Senate. Your governor general can't do a thing in Barbados unless the queen gives him the authority. Anything that's going to change the shape of Barbados, that's going to change the political shape of Barbados, he has to get approval from back home. Well, here Jesus, in West Indian language, if Caesar thinks that he alone could have ecclesia, well, I build my ecclesia on this truth that I am the son of the living God, sent to earth with ambassadorial authority, with royal grace. With the same power as my father, the king. I think I thought it not robbery to be equal with him. But I came down with his authority to reimpose his power and authority in the earth. So I, living, the son of the living God, king of kings and lord of lords, build my church. I've called out my ecclesia. You 12 apostles, you are my called out ones. I invest you today with all my authorities. Whatever decisions you make, heaven has already made them. Oh, Jesus. I think I lost a few people, but for those who still follow me, and it could be on the CD, see if you could catch, me, catch up with me. Because watch this, because watch this, watch this. In, 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 in Barbados, there is a, a, a U.S. embassy. Huh? There's a U.S. embassy. Isn't it funny that before you, before you even get the visa, you're already telling your family in Yankee language, I'm going to the embassy. I'm going for my visa. Visa. Uh, I tell you, I'm going to get it because I pray to God that they will stamp it approved. I'm I, I looking for 10 years. I'm going to tell them like a bitch, and hey, tomorrow I'll go over yonder, down there. I'm I, I going to apply for the visa. That lends credence to what I'm saying. Wherever you intend to go, you're going to speak the language up. I know Bajans hardly lose their, they don't give up their accent so much, but we in Trinidad, boy, from the time you get your appointment, hey, 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 pray for me. I, I'm going to Marley Street tomorrow. I, I, I'm going for my visa. I, I, I just won't spend the summer in the cold 
Up there, just be hotter than down here, boy. Let me tell you. All right. But let's, let's finish off. Tomorrow night, we'll pick up this. Jesus said, upon this truth, this revelatory truth, this prophetic word, that's why religious people are not really part of the church. Because if you're religious, you will not accept prophecy. And prophecy is what the church was built on. You cannot be preaching on a Sunday morning and you don't like the prophets. Because the whole authority on which you stand behind this pulpit is based on a man being downloaded a prophetic word. And Jesus said, I'm building my ecclesia on this. And let me just point out three things and tomorrow we pick it up from here. He says this. I build my church. I dare say to you, only three times does Jesus say the word church. Right here in Matthew 16 and then in Matthew 18 when he's settling arguments in the church. He say, if you go to your brother and your brother don't want to hear you, take it to the church. And then he say, if your brother don't want to hear the church, put him out. And we are so big on church, I tell you. But then I check my, my, my Bible concordance and I realize kingdom is mentioned 121 times in the Gospels alone. And 179 times in the New Testament. Mathematically speaking, alone. Kingdom has to be more important than church. The US, America, USA is more important than the embassy down here. Although that is virtual embassy. Virtual USA. Oh, and tomorrow night we'll talk more about that. That church is virtual heaven. But because religion is encroaching on the church to enslave us again, we have to get out of church, the four wall mentality, and get into kingdom. Because when the king of kings came down, he stopped at church three times. And after that, all he did was kingdom. And the kingdom has ecclesias, embassies, given authoritative instruments to implement whatever the king says. So he comes in the verse, in the verse 19. As soon as he says, I build my church, the next thing he says in terms of an entity, he says this, behold, I give you the keys of the kingdom. He didn't say the keys of the church. He didn't say the keys of new dimension. He didn't say the keys of religion. He said the keys of the church. Of the church, no. He said the keys of the kingdom. Why? Because the church is an embassy of heaven. Eden was an embassy of heaven. That's why God f felt free to come down into Eden. And that's why he told, he told Adam, guard this place. Why would God tell Adam, guard the garden, if there was nobody else in it? He said, guard this garden. Why? Because there is an intruder who will try to get in to mess up the embassy. Satan started religion. Religion endorses itself by being in the church. Put religion in the street and nobody cares about it. So religion comes into the church for authenticity. But tell your neighbor, we will drive that spirit out of here. I say we're driving that spirit out of here. Because there are some things, there are some benefits of being in an embassy. When the church is an embassy, my God, you do what heaven says. And you can actually recreate heaven's atmosphere. Oh, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Do you know even a diplomatic car, a car flying a flag of the home country, no policeman in Barbados could stop it. 
If you get inside that car and lock the door, you cannot be arrested even for the worst felony. They'll have to do the extradition thing to get you out of that car and put in a Bajan jail. We continue this tomorrow. Ask your neighbor, did you learn something today? I, I, I didn't ask, say to your neighbor, if you did learn something, then you are now held responsible for living according to it. When, when, when Prophet Duane prophesied today, he started a whole flow about river, everybody was singing a river song. I mean, that was so awesome. Why is this a, uh, uh, what's the name of the lady who was leading the worship again? I keep forgetting her name. Sister, Suzanne was leading the worship. And she was, I think she did the, about three times she interjected with a river, uh, something about the river. And then the two ladies came. The Lord was telling me this and uh, we're going to release it right now. Once you're talking about water, somebody say water. That's what a river is consisting of, water. Water. Once you're talking water, you're talking birthing. The river, you don't know how, uh, I can't tell you, you don't know how prophetic you're a prophet. But you even know the full depth of what you were saying. For, for birthing to take place, the first thing that happens is the water has to birth. Before you see blood, you see water. Because blood is really water. That is made up of red and red corpuses and other elements. But it's really water. That's why it flows. And Lord said to me, He said, if they truly understand the depth of what they are singing today, then they'll prepare themselves for change. That's why I did say, if people want change, but they don't want to be changed. When the little child, when the little child responds to the water being, be, being broken, and the convulsions of the mother's womb until that child comes through the birth canal, no child will ever accept you trying to push him back of the birth canal. That's why he comes out head first. I say he comes out head first. Before he could walk to go anywhere, he is thinking. Tell your neighbor you need to come out head first. Before you could go anywhere, say neighbor, we prophesying neighbor. Before you could go anywhere, before you could use your feet, think. And the Lord says, new dimension was birthed this morning and it will continue to be birthed during this week into a new dimension of living and understanding the waters have broken and there is a new life that's going to exude out of the ministry a new life will come out of the heart of the ministry into your heart into your family into your business if you are ready for that shout glory and he says Many intercessors in this house have shed tears for what they have seen in relation to what should be. The waters broke and God said your tears have not been in vain. <laughs> oh no, oh no, no, you didn't write a big sign on your chest, I'm an intercessor. But in your motor car while driving, it was saying, God, don't let this convention be the same again. In your home while you lie down on your bed, trying to drop asleep, you say, Lord, let us be different. God says, I have responded to the waters 
that broke and that's why I gave that song this morning and there is a brand new thing that's going to come out of this place Karabashanda. something and I dare say to those in divine destiny the waters have broken as well there's a whole new thing is, that's going to come forth eh? Karabashanda. there's a kingdom life that's going to come forth out of four men four wall mentality thinking Then he said, it's living water. He says, if you keep meditating on my word, what you hear during this week, you put it together with what you've been hearing, he said, I will run rivers of living water right close to you so that you'll never thirst. When there's a famine for the word, in Barbados, you will never suffer that. When there's a famine for the word in Trinidad, Antigua, wherever, you will never suffer that because I will continuously run living water or living revelation your way. Then he said to me, living water, birthing water, it's also healing water. Right now, you're in this house and you are sick in your body. I want you to stand where you are because we're releasing a fresh flow. I was coming up with a song, boy, but I don't think the musicians could have followed me ah, because I was hearing, and the waters are troubled. Somebody said, The waters are troubled. And when the waters are troubled, there is healing for whoever jumps in. So neighbor, the waters are troubled. There's healing for you. Just jump in. Jump in. Get soaked all over. Wherever you are sick, whatever is the complaint, let the waters get into you. Because the waters are troubled. And there is healing. Now, in the name of Jesus, put your hands up. Lift your hands up. I'm giving one mass prayer. Maybe at another time we may call people out. But one mass prayer, because this, the, I mean, the, the, the worship was that intense, Karabashanda, that what was up at the front went down to the back. Hallelujah. And it's flowing all out to the sides. And it's flowing all out the door. And I'm prophesying, even if you are not sick and there's some relative of yours that's sick, I want you to stand too. Because this water is flowing to the nursing home. It's flowing to the hospital. It's flowing to your home. It's flowing overseas. It's flowing wherever that relative is. In the name of Jesus. In fact, you could put the hand down and hold the person, hands with the person next to you. Because I, I, I'm hearing the Lord says, oh, say, saying, where the two or three are gathered in my name, together in my name. I'm in the midst and I'm hearing him saying, one will chase a thousand, but two will chase ten thousand. I'm hearing him saying, behold, how oh, good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I, 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 I'm hearing him saying, if two shall agree. So in the name of Jesus, I decree. There's a healing. There's a healing. There's a healing. There is a healing. There is a healing for your situation. You're a part of the embassy. The embassy of God called the church. There are instruments of authority that have been released to the church. And one of them is that you... You shall pray for the sick, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's an instrument of authority that brings heavenly living in the earth. Because as far as God is concerned, your body is his temple. And God's temple is healthy. So, at the count of three, I'm decreeing you healed. 
and delivered. Father, in your name, we stand with your people, all of us needing healing to some measure, some to our bodies, some to specific limbs, some concerning, Lord, the various glandular systems in our bodies, some concerning our limbs, some concerning our organs, some is the circulatory system, some is the digestive system, some is the respiratory system, some is the endocrine system, some, Lord, is the joints, the knees, the elbows, the neck, Lord, the, the, the shoulders, uh, the wrists, some, Lord, is the skin, all kind of growths and rashes, but there is one blood, one blood that the king shed for us and we apply that blood right now to every part of our being that's suffering from some, some ailment and we declare be healed in the name of Jesus out in Trinidad be healed in Antigua be healed in Tobago be healed in Barbados be healed in Curacao be healed right now let the waters flow as the waters cover the sea, so do the waters of God's glory flow in this house in waves of healing. The ulcer in the stomach, Lord, we declare healing for that. The growth in the chest, we declare healing for that. The cancerous lump, we declare healing for that. The pain in the neck, we declare healing for that. Lord, the gangrenous foot, Lord, that don't seem to heal right now, we declare healing for that. We declare by your authority, Lord, the, the blood flow to the lower part of our limbs. We declare it doesn't matter whether it's diabetes or not. We rebuke that diabetical spirit and we prophesy, hallelujah, that the blood is going to flow again in the feet. Hallelujah. And Lord, the sores that can be healed are being healed right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Cramping calves that don't seem to, to want to respond to the tablets and the exercise. I prophesy to your calves right now. Those muscles in your calves, I command them. You don't need no extra salt so that you could function. I prophesy the word of God is salt indeed. Lord, the person with the vertigo problem can stand up properly, feeling like they're going to fall down. I prophesy to that fluid in your air. Stabilize right now. Stabilize right now. A person with that sinus situation, Lord, Lord, that causes even the breath to smell. I prophesy to that sinusitis situation. Be healed. I take the instrument of authority for healing and we apply it to everybody in the house. And wherever this service has been, live stream, receive it right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. You can lift your hand and say, Lord, I receive, I receive my healing. Lord, I receive, I receive my deliverance. Lord, I believe, I believe your word for you said that your word is like water and you said that your word, that your word is healing. healing you sent your word, you your word to, heal to heal my body you sent your word, you your word to heal my heart, heal my heart. You, sent your word you sent your word to heal my heart 
Time to prosper. Or say that seven times. This is our time to prosper. One. This is our time to prosper. Two. This is our time to prosper. Three. This is our time to prosper. Four. This is our time to prosper. Five. This is our time to prosper. Six. This is our time to prosper. Seven. This is our time to prosper.
we're just getting started. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You, you can't afford to lose this word. Amen. When you go to the Embassy of the United States of America, right there in Wildy, as you step on the property, there's a sign. They're in Barbados, but there's a sign. And it says, Welcome to the United States of America. You got what I'm saying? Are you in America? But they say, Welcome. Because they're ruled by the laws of the United States of America. This is the Embassy of Heaven. Amen. Welcome to Heaven. So whenever we come together, heaven, it must be a sense of heaven in our midst. Can you look at somebody beside you and say, welcome to heaven. Now, if the presence of heaven isn't here, something is wrong. This may have shut down the embassy and recall the ambassadors. But as long as we meet together, heaven should be touching earth and earth touching heaven therefore now you got me gone with this thing apostle <laughs> do you know the economy of barbados does not impact on the on the um the embassy of the united states of america all right then if there's a recession in barbados and there's none in the United States. There's no recession in the embassy of the United States. Therefore, there's no recession where we are concerned. Amen. Are you ready for this? All right. Because we're not ruled by the recession in Barbados because there's no recession in the kingdom of heaven. So we ain't receding going anywhere. Our finances are blessed. Well, thank God for some of you. So if you lose your job, you don't worry. Oh, Jesus is going to help us get this, you know. Because I'm ruled by heaven. So my prayer this week is that God would do something in our lives that would totally change us and that we will live by different standards. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so good. God is so good. Oh yeah. I can't wait for, t for tomorrow evening as we continue this. Wow. It's going to get better and better. Praise God. To God we give the glory, the honor, and the praise. Don't forget, um, apostles, uh, their books are available on the outside. Please do more than browse. Just purchase some books, all right? One moment. There are few people that know they need to see Elder Harriet. Please see her right away. Don't forget. In the name of Jesus, I declare the blessings of the Lord upon your life as you prepare to leave this place. We go in the atmosphere of heaven. We go with the blessings of God upon us. I declare God's grace, His peace, His glory, His covering to rest and remain upon your life as you leave this place. I speak blessings, peace, and prosperity upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.